All right, let's dive right in. Welcome to my virtual studio coming to you from a little bit north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Today I'm going to be showing my slides right here in my virtual world. I'll talk a little bit about how we can do this when we talk about the future of sales. So, the future and how to prosper in it. IT, intentionally capitalized. Yes, it is a world of information technology. I'm an engineer by training. Went to school here at uh, Stanford, got my master's degree in operations research tragically long ago. Now the thing about being an engineer is you get exposed to a lot of different theory. Engineers do not love theory. It's all about the application and that is the philosophy of today's presentation. I'm going to bring, be bringing you ideas that are highly applicable to your business. But if you happen to be the kind of person who loves theory, hey, there's room for both of us because if it works in practice, which is what I'm talking about, it'll work in theory. So we're both good. Now, sometimes when I do this talk, people accuse me of being a little dark. I am super optimistic about the future. And if you are not, or you're questioning where I'm coming from at any time today, please read this book, Abundance, by Peter Diamandis. The future is better than you think. As big data and artificial intelligence and automation and 24 by 7 operation comes into our businesses, think about it. Cost goes down, productivity goes up. We collectively are going to produce a level of abundance for the human race like the planet has never seen before. So Dave is super optimistic. Keep that in mind. Now, sometimes naming the problem is half of the solution. So I want to tell you what's going on in the world today. I used to work for AT&T Bell Labs, so I, I read stuff like this uh, 2015 Analyst Conference Report. This talks about what happened to AT&T's network during the first eight years of the iPhone. Now, why would you care what happened to AT&T's mobile backbone network here in the United States? Well, here's the thing. Their subscriber base did not change substantially during this period of time. So what happened on their network also on the same percentage basis happened on each of our phones. So try to get your head around this. And this is true whether you're an AT&T customer or maybe Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint. I'm pretty sure this is happening to all of us. The amount of traffic on their backbone network and therefore on our mobile phones starting in 2007 through the end of 2014, an eight-year period inclusive, grew by an astounding 100,000%. 100,000%. Now that was the end of 2014. To update you to where we stand today, I have to make my axis here 33 times higher. And so here's that same 100,000%. And to bring you up to the beginning of 2020, there's where we stand now, cumulatively 3.2 million percent. And in order to show you where we think we're going next, I have to represent everything that happened till now with one pixel. And here are the next 10 years. The problem is we are now living in an exponential world and we arrived at this gunfight with linear brains. How are we going to do that? The answer is technology. You're also going to find out today it's really valuable to understand more about these things called exponentials. So I'm going to show you some great tricks. Here's the first one. This might be the best party trick you learned today. Uh, many of us use Microsoft Excel every single day. I have constructed right here an exponential series. Now what defines that is it simply doubles at a given period. I haven't even specified the period here, but 2 becomes 4, becomes 8, becomes 16, becomes 32. And there's your resulting graph. Now the problem is, with our traditional linear graphs, it's very hard to see what these exponentials really look like and very easy to underestimate them, especially in the early days. So here's the trick. Notice over here when you're formatting your Excel axis, there's a little checkbox. Let me bring that out, make it a little bigger so you can clearly read it on Zoom. Logarithmic scale. Just flip the scale and watch what happens. There's only one thing you need to know about what happens next. And it is exponentials plotted on a logarithmic scale show up as a straight line. And that's very handy. So we can always know when we're dealing with an exponential and ideally not underestimate it. Here's the thing. The first doubling or second doubling or even five doublings, you're still dealing with two digits. 
10 doublings is when it gets really interesting and hard to ignore because 10 doublings, 10 periods is a 100,000% increase. And so we are seeing the amount of information double in the world roughly every year. Two becomes four, next year becomes eight. You get the idea. This is exponentials. Uh, now, COVID, another exponential. So let's just take a quick look here. And I got to tell you, the real lesson out of COVID is to how to understand exponentials. In the 20s, next 10 years, businesses are going to deal with at least a dozen exponentials. And I'll list them for you here in a moment. Okay, so this is our COVID cases in the early days. This is through about the end of March, plotted on a linear scale. And here's the same data on a logarithmic scale. There is an amazing story not told until you start to look at this exponential logarithmically. Now remember, when the line is going straight, the doubling time is constant, you've got an exponential. And you'll notice from about the beginning of March 1 to about March 20, this thing was moving as a straight line on our logarithmic scale. That means you've got an exponential. And in fact, we just let this thing double for 10 periods because the doubling time was two days. And so we experienced in that 20 days almost 100,000% growth in known cases of COVID. But let's dive in and look at the end of that period. And so as we started to take action in this country, whatever you want to call it, social distancing, shelter in place, lockdown, the end of that period, you can see roughly 7,000 cases becomes 14,000 cases, two days. But now we're starting to take action just after March 20. And so now roughly 20,000 cases becomes roughly 40,000 cases, but in three days. Almost instant ability to see the impact of what we're doing. Just a little bit later in March, roughly 70,000 cases becomes roughly 140,000 cases, but that doubling took four days. The strategy is working instantly. And in fact, the great untold story of the early days of battling COVID was the tremendous success we experienced. Now you know the key metric when dealing with an exponential is doubling time. And by June 9th, we pushed the doubling time on this thing out to 73 days. There is always some debate whether, you know, is this better testing, worse testing? Guess what? In these statistics, when you're looking at doubling time, there is nominal testing skew. Test more, test less, doesn't change the numbers. Tremendous success. But with a virus, you can never let down your guard. It's still out there. If we go back to the old behaviors, it goes back to its old spread rates. And let me show you what I mean. And this should be a lesson. I'm coming right home, right here home to my own county, Allegheny. That's the Pitt Pittsburgh MSA. And so now you know the, uh, the key metric is doubling time. And so you're looking at a time scale moving that way across the top, an inverted scale right here of doubling time in days. What you want to see on this kind of chart is down as you move to the right. And that's exactly what happened here in Allegheny County. We rocked this thing. We shut it down. In fact, we did tremendous work against this and drove the doubling time to almost 180 days by mid-June. Success, we flattened the curve, we won. Open up the bars, let's go back to all our old habits. And I don't think I saw anywhere in the country the collapse of the strategy faster than right here. Yeah, you go back to your old behaviors, it goes back to its old spread rates. And you know what this is? Right there, you're looking at three months of wasted investment. And I don't just mean government investment, I mean the cost we paid economically in battling this thing. So now we are right back three months later to where we were back here in April. And now we gotta do it all over again. There should be a lesson in that. You cannot relax until we have one of our silver bullets. That might be something like our vaccine. And so great lesson coming from COVID and when you're dealing with exponentials, there's your key metric, doubling time. Now that's gonna be very useful as we look to the future. Here are my takeaways before we leave behind the pandemic. We need to redesign our businesses to achieve three things. And so think about this if you haven't done this already. And the reason my letters are backwards here is because I'm inside your business now, I'm looking out. And so I'm talking inside the operation, three imperatives. Number one, we need to achieve virtually flawless 
virtually flawless social distancing. And when you can't be physically six feet apart, then you have to do it virtually. And I'm talking about things like uh, ideally PPE grade masks, N95 and 100 or plexiglass, right? There's lots of ways to create a virtual distance of six feet and beware. Ventilation is important as we're starting to come back inside because it's about exposure to the virus, not necessarily all at once, but cumulatively over time. So if you're in a low density environment but for a long period of time, you can get sick. So we need to achieve virtually flawless social distancing. Ventilation is important going forward. Number two, <clears throat> we need to eliminate virtually all potential surface transmission of SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus. Viruses spread on surfaces. This one is three times more contagious than the flu. And yes, statistically, that's not how most people get it, but do not ignore surfaces. They're still an issue. I'm talking in the operation, the coffee room. Okay, so you shut down the uh, break room, give everyone their own Kerrig. What about the bathrooms? SARS-CoV-2 is viable for 72 hours, three days on things like stainless steel or plastic. And so we have to pay attention to those kinds of things. And then number three, and this is a little bit of an expansion of our thinking with respect to our businesses, but I'm doing it just purely in the interest of productivity for the business. We need to account for the employees' kids. Even as the kids go back to school, it might not be in your area full time. And so maybe they're in the classroom a couple of days at home a couple of days. Yeah, there is nothing that is a bigger productivity killer than one of your employees working from home dealing with a four year old. And so maybe we want to expand our thinking a little bit. Have we thought about helping our employees set up better work from home spaces? Yeah, it's an interesting question, expanding of our thinking. And you're gonna see, I believe, that work from home is here to stay at least for some percentage of our employees, and I'll tell you why as we get into this. So once the pandemic is gone, there are some productivity gains and cost savings to be had. Those are the three imperatives. Redesign your business to achieve those things. Now, with respect to exponentials, let me show you what exponentials can do looking at technology. This is the Cray Model 2, 1985, the world's most powerful supercomputer. And this is the Apple Watch introduced exactly 30 years later. And the relative size is shown here. So that's about how big the Apple Watch is compared to the Cray Model 2. But if I resize these things based on processing power, what you would see is the Apple Watch 30 years later has twice the processing power four times the memory. By the way, that thing over there consumes 195 kilowatts of power. Yeah, that would run a lot of our homes. It uh, needs a water-cooled system, so you're looking at a uh, radiator unit here out front. It weighs 2.75 tons. Over here, 1.97 ounces. And if you took off the uh, bezel and the face of this thing and actually looked at the computer within, it's about a gram. That is the world of exponentials. Price reduced by a factor of 140,000 times. Try putting that on your wrist. Yeah, that's not going to work. As we look at our businesses, many other exponential acceleration is going to be affecting us here in the next decade. That one's called Moore's Law. Storage capacity, bandwidth, both transmission speed and latency, cloud capabilities, nanotechnology, Microbiology, gene editing, CRISPR, Cas9, big data, pattern recognition, artificial intelligence, internet of things, blockchain, yeah, technology that allows humans to interact with trust. Energy cost reduction, 50% per end decades. Yeah, it'll be slower, but there will be some doubling or halving time. And so even energy cost is gonna follow its own exponential curve. These things are going to change businesses and not everyone is going to survive. Now, something for you to consider. One of my strategies to keep up in a world of too much information is to go to the audio domain. We are often physically engaged when we are not cognitively engaged. I'm talking about driving the car, exercising, mowing the lawn time. That's when you can listen and learn. So I'm a huge fan of audiobooks and podcasts. Listen to this podcast 
by the author of the book, Abundance, I mentioned earlier. It's called Exponential Wisdom. We're on episode one. There's at least 100 episodes out there for you to listen to. About 15 minutes in, listen to what Peter Diamandis has to say about business. I mean, there's a finesse, right? It's over the last, I will call it decade, last five years, it's a real fundamental understanding that the only constant is change and the rate of change is increasing. And this is a really hard thing for people to realize. We all tend to think of what we have in our hands today, the technology in our cell phone, our digital cameras, our GPS, the software, as the end-all, be-all. This is like we've reached perfection. But the fact of the matter is it's just a point in time. It's going to be a thousand times better in a decade, a million times better in 20 years, a billion times better in 30 years. So the only constant is change, and the rate of change is increasing. The second thing is that every company, every product, every service, every single one will become disrupted, will become obsoleted. So you either are going to disrupt yourself or someone else will. Now think about what he said right there at the end. Every single product, every single service, every single company will become disrupted given this rate of change, will become obsoleted. Disrupt yourself or someone else will. It's no longer about doing business tomorrow just a little bit better than we did today. We have to look for the disruptions, the technology advantage relative to our competition. A cautionary tale. Remember the BlackBerry? In January of 2007, BlackBerry had more than half the smartphone market. And yet, ironically, by 2016, September 28th, end of an era, BlackBerry will stop making its own phones. That's less than one decade for a leading technology company. To go from more than half the global market share to zero. Today there are seven Android devices for each Apple device shown in green there. There's a little sliver of some Chinese knockoffs there, 1% and zero Blackberries. If that can happen to a leading technology company in one decade, let that be a cautionary tale for all of us. Now, let's dive in and talk about some of the disruptors and what we can do about them. The future of work, or perhaps we should call this, this first topic, the future of no work. Humans are starting to look a lot like horses right before the Model T. Yeah, you know what happened to horses? There were a lot of them in the world. That population peaked in 1915. A video essay, you'll want to watch the whole thing offline. A video essay on how robots are already taking jobs. Let me play for you just two short snippets. Here's the first. Every human used to have to hunt or gather to survive, but humans are smartly lazy, so we made tools to make our work easier. From sticks to plows to tractors, we've gone from everyone needing to make food to modern agriculture with almost no one needing to make food. I have to pause here just for a second. Check out that graph. It used to be, back when this country was started, almost everybody worked in keeping themselves alive, feeding themselves. And today, almost no one does. I want to point this out because we tend to define ourselves today by what we do. You go to a cocktail party, first question, what do you do? We define ourselves by what we do professionally. That's not the way it was in the past, and it doesn't need to be that way in the future. Imagine a party in uh, 1800. You go to a party, you meet somebody new. What do you do? I'm a farmer. <laughs> oh, me too. What a coincidence. Yeah, you do not have to define or derive your self-worth by what you do professionally. Okay, keep that in mind because it wasn't always that way and maybe it won't be in the future of no work. Let's keep going. And yet, we still have abundance. Of course, it's not just farming, it's everything. We've spent the last several thousand years building tools to reduce physical labor of all kinds. These are mechanical muscles, stronger, more reliable, and more tireless than human muscles ever could be. And that's a good thing, 
Replacing human labor with mechanical muscles frees people to specialize, and that leaves everyone better off, even those still doing physical labor. This is how economies grow and standards of living rise. Some people have specialized to be programmers and engineers whose job is to build mechanical minds. Just as mechanical muscles made human labor less in demand, so are mechanical minds making human brain labor less in demand. This is an economic revolution. You may think we've been here before, but we haven't. This time is different. Interesting thought there as I pause this video. It's making human brain labor, brain power, less in demand. We're all capitalists, right? Supply and demand. Well, if there's more supply of cognitive capability, yeah, it's making human brain power, brain labor, less in demand. You may think we've been here before, but we haven't. This time, it's different. Let's go a little bit further to really understand why. So one more clip. Here goes. And because their mechanical minds are capable of decision-making, they are out-competing humans for jobs in a way no pure mechanical muscle ever could. Imagine a pair of horses in the early 1900s talking about technology. One worries all these new mechanical muscles will make horses unnecessary. The other reminds him that everything so far has made their lives easier. Remember all that farm work? Remember running from coast to coast delivering mail? Remember riding into battle? All terrible. These new city jobs are pretty cushy, and with so many humans in the cities, there will be more jobs for horses than ever. Even if this car thingy takes off, he might say, there will be new jobs for horses we can't imagine. But you, dear viewer, from beyond 2000, know what happened. There are still working horses, but nothing like before. The horse population peaked in 1915. From that point on, it was nothing but down. There isn't a rule of economics that says better technology makes more better jobs for horses. It sounds shockingly dumb to even say that out loud, but swap horses for humans and suddenly people think it sounds about right. As mechanical muscles pushed horses out of the economy, mechanical minds will do the same to humans. Not immediately, not everywhere, but in large enough numbers and soon enough that it's going to be a huge problem if we're not prepared. And we're not prepared. You, like the second horse, may look at the state of technology now and think it can't possibly replace your job, but technology gets better, cheaper, and faster at a rate biology can't match. Just as the car was the beginning of the end for the horse, so now does the car show us the shape of things to come. Self-driving cars aren't the future. They're here and they work. Self-driving cars have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles up and down the California coast and through cities all without human intervention. The question is not if they'll replace cars, but how quickly. They don't need to be perfect, they just need to be better than us. Human drivers, by the way, kill 40,000 people a year with cars just in the United States. Given that self-driving cars don't blink, don't text while driving, don't get sleepy or stupid, it's easy to see them being better than humans because they already are. Alright, a couple of key thoughts there. First, better technology always makes more better jobs for horses, right? Now you think about this, what happened a hundred years ago? Technology started to replace or leverage muscle power. Most humans at that point in time earned a living using their muscles. That's not where we are today. Most of us earn a living using our minds. And so we move from the muscle domain to the brain domain. Now the computers are coming into the brain domain to compete directly there. Where do we go this time? It's different. And so the second point to consider is this. Technology gets better, cheaper, faster at a rate biology can't match. We've been watching the early part of that exponential curve, but it doubles and it doubles and it doubles and it doubles. So get ready. Now, this headline I think is sort of fake news, a little bit uh, misleading. Self-driving Uber car kills Arizona pedestrian. Well, actually the headline is right on, although featuring it on the front page and this particular image that the New York Times used. Yeah, it's a sunny day, 10 a.m., she's right in the crosswalk, what could possibly go wrong? Let me show you the reality of what happened with this autonomous vehicle. Here we are in Tempe, Arizona. 
Uh, it is 10 o'clock at night. It's very dark. You can see by the, the aerial view there is uh, one street light in this area. And Elaine Hertzberg is walking her bike through this vegetation and about to emerge onto this multi-lane merge point. And, uh, well, we have data on this. See, the thing is autonomous vehicles are in a constant data collection mode. So I want to show you what actually happened. And consider this. A human driver needs about two second reaction time. How would a human have handled this situation? I'll even try to count one Mississippi for you as soon as I can see Elaine. So let's watch the video. No audio here. I'm not going to show you the point of impact, but we're always collecting data. So here is our Uber traveling on that. One Mississippi. I didn't even get one second there before the point of impact. Now, that makes worldwide news. So self-driving Uber car kills Arizona pedestrian. Let me ask you, did you see these other headlines at the same time? No, because they were buried on page 15, maybe section D. Uber driver strikes and kills crossing guard with car. Uber driver arrested after fatally hitting a man in the crosswalk. Woman dies after being struck by Uber driver. A seven-year-old San Francisco girl struck and killed by Uber driver. Yeah, a lot of bad human drivers, and I could show you a dozen more, and dozens and dozens and dozens more. And so the fact that that one accident was front page, a little bit misleading, and so don't be misled. This technology is coming. This is how Uber sees the world. Uh, everything in blue is static. It was reported in by some other Uber vehicle or this one on a previous pass. Everything in orange is happening dynamically. And all that data goes back to the engineers after an accident. There's only two possible problems here. Number one, did the imaging system miss Elaine? No, it saw her for six seconds ahead of the point of impact. So number two, was there a software problem? Yes. Let's fix the software and guess what? Next time an Uber is passing that exact spot at that exact hour and that uh, you know, pedestrian crosses that same exact path, no accident. And yet the humans go on doing what the humans go on doing. So these autonomous vehicles are already better than humans, but they're getting better at an exponential rate. So let me show you what's going on with one of the companies. This is Waymo, which is the division of what we used to call Google, what we now call Alphabet and it is about the miles that they're covering in the real world. It took six years from 2009 to 2015 to cover the first one million miles. And then for Waymo to cover the next million miles took 1.5 years. Next million, three quarters of a year. By the summer of 2018, a couple years ago, they're knocking out a million miles a month and cross over 10 million miles. And that's the real world exponential, but at the same time, they're running simulation on a thousand times more miles than that. So it's not 10 million, it's 10 billion. Technology gets better, cheaper, faster, more reliable at a rate biology can't match. And so today, worldwide, we lose about a million humans every year due to auto accidents, not even to mention the tens of millions of injuries. You're going to see in our lifetime, amazingly quickly, that number will drop to 100,000. And then it will drop to 10,000. And then it will drop to 1,000. I'm not saying it's going to go to zero. Software is never perfect, as Boeing has proven with their 737 uh, MAX planes. But it's way better than humans. And think about it. If you're a politician or a regulator trying to hold back this tide, what you're essentially voting for, you're standing on the side of killing not a million people, or a thousand people, but a million people. You're standing on the side of killing a million people, not a thousand people. That sounds like a tough position to take. Now, all sorts of implications. For example, the number one job for men in the United States of America is driving something. As you can see here in some states, it's up to four or five percent. Those jobs are gone. The enemy is not immigration. The enemy is not offshoring. The enemy, or friend, depending on your perspective, is automation. And so now we see TED Talks like this. The rise of the useless class. Yes, yeah, some 
portion of our human population will be able to do nothing that is as valuable economically as what the machines can do because they are now not just in the muscle domain but in the brain domain competing with our minds. Now I think the headline here, this TED talk by Yuval Noah Harari, a little bit harsh. So I just want to point out something. Just because you can't make an economic contribution doesn't actually mean you're useless. So let's say the rise of the economically useless class, you can still make a social contribution, for example. Now, I'm a big believer that if we have better vision of what's coming down the pike, better vision equals better business decisions. Better vision equals better resource allocation, better investment. So here is a process that you can use with your team, and I'm actually going to walk you through a little bit of it. I'm coming to you, as I said earlier, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We are the worldwide capital of autonomous vehicle research. For four years, as of this past September, we have had autonomous Ubers running around our city. Two conditions. Uh, number one, they have to have a, an attendant inside to intervene if there's a software or imaging system glitch. Number two, they have to be free to the citizens of Pittsburgh while they are still in a testing mode. So Uber for four years has been running around our streets. Pittsburgh is a very complex city, 446 bridges, more than any, more bridges than any city in the world. We have a saying, when people ask for directions, no, you can't get there from here. If you can master autonomous vehicles in Pittsburgh, these are gonna work anywhere. Once the other autonomous vehicle company saw this happening in Pittsburgh, they brought their vehicles to our town. Five different companies, dozens of vehicles any given day running around our city autonomously. Now, let's talk about a vision process. I call this the vision innovation exercise. You're gonna to wanna to do it with your team. It's three simple steps. So step one, you pick some date that you're interested in. So you start by specifying the date. And I'm going to do this for you with autonomous vehicles in a second. And with your team, with respect to that date, you brainstorm potential scenarios, things that might be the case by that point in time. Now, as you do your brainstorming with your team, and don't be too judgy here, get your list of things that might happen with respect to that target date. I'm going to suggest that maybe January 1, 2021, and July 1, 2021 be interesting days to do as targets with your team. Come up with your list of scenarios, possible things that might happen. And then, having generated the list, maybe 15 or 30 minutes of brainstorming, fun activity on a Friday afternoon, step back and look at those that would have the largest impact, positively or negatively, or maybe the highest probability. Pick two or maybe three, and then for each of those, Go to the next step. And this is the mental shift. This is where it gets interesting. What you do is you assume that it is now that date and that thing has happened. Okay, so it is now that date, that thing has happened. What are the implications? And when you do this with a diverse team, people start feeding off of each other. None of us is as smart as all of us. And it's funny, in that discussion, it starts to reveal opportunities and threats. And then you can choose which of those to pursue. So that's the relatively simple three-step process for your team. Now, I'm gonna give you a scenario. So the scenario is this. Autonomous vehicles everywhere. The year is 2025. And if you ask me, that's a reasonable prediction for when this will happen, about five years out. So 2025, autonomous vehicles are everywhere. Now, people, give me some implications of that. You start this discussion with a team. Now, I'm just gonna throw a few of these at you. These vehicles have lower accident rates. Okay, so let's see, what does that mean? Well, number one, the ER at the local hospital. Do you realize that about 25 to 50% of ER capacity is used for vehicular accidents? Those big rigs, they represent uh, 5% of accidents, 9% of fatalities on the nation's highways. All of a sudden, those things aren't happening. We just freed up this really expensive part of our healthcare system and those doctors to go do better things. 
And those million humans that would have been killed and tens of millions injured, not coming back into our society. Interesting. At the same time, if, if these vehicles don't crash, we don't need so many auto body shops, right? You start to see the implications. But let's go further. If they don't crash, auto insurance. We don't need auto insurance rates where they are today if the risk goes down. And here's the thing. These probably won't be mostly individually owned vehicles. These will be fleets from Uber and Ford and GM and Tesla. And so they might be self-insured. And so what happens to the insurance companies when all of a sudden their most profitable line, auto insurance, revenues go to essentially zero. Now, maybe none of you runs uh, State Farm or Geico or Progressive, but are those people somewhere in your ecosystem? Because that pain is going to flow backwards, downhill, as those companies try to reconcile their costs to this new world. You start to see how thinking through the implications allows us potentially, in this case, to diversify our customer base. Let me give you another implication. If these are fleet owned, we're not buying cars from auto dealers. And the reason I think they're fleet owned and we're not buying cars is this. Even today, using Uber is pretty cost effective. Do you realize that 75% of Uber's revenues pass through the drivers? There's no drivers in the future of Uber, and so these things become incredibly cost effective. Economically, it will not make sense to own a vehicle. Do you realize that the average vehicle is utilized 2 to 4% of the time? Uh, is it beyond uh, comprehension that these vehicles in fleets might be utilized 20% of the time? But think about that. If they're utilized 20% of the time compared to, say, 4 we only need one-fifth as many vehicles. So here's a question. How does a company like GM or Ford reconcile its cost structure, or Toyota, to a world where we're producing only one-fifth as many vehicles? I don't know if you've been paying attention to the market cap, the market valuation of Tesla, but last time I looked, Tesla was valued by investors, by the stock market, at more than Ford plus GM plus Toyota, and you add a whole bunch more in there, all added together. Why? I don't know for sure, but here's the theory. Is it possible that in this world of autonomous vehicles, that it is far better to be a small company today growing into that market than a large company trying to reconcile to massive, massive volume reductions in production? I don't know. Maybe. Interesting world. Now, if we're getting better utilization out of these vehicles and we don't have to pay for drivers, again, that capital cost gets spread out. We can do this all day. Let me give you another implication. Uh, these fleet owners are going to have somebody who works on Microsoft Excel all day. And that Excel jockey is going to be running a spreadsheet one day and then come running to the boss. Hey, boss! Check out what I've just figured out. These autonomous vehicles, and by the way, I took this uh, video when I was walking by a Tesla dealer. This is a Tesla with the chassis off. Everything it requires to make it go. So you can see there the suspension system. This is the uh, front motor, as we call it. Uh, no liquids, right? There's no radiator system. There's no transmission system. These are the batteries right there, right there in that deck. And this is a dual motor vehicle, redundancy. And so there you got the bed. This thing has no parts, like 1% of the parts of a typical ICE vehicle, internal combustion engine. So the Excel jockey running the numbers on these things says, hey, boss, check this out. 1% of the parts, we're going to get a usable life on these things of probably two to four times what an ICE vehicle has. And so we're much better utilizing our capital. And oh, by the way, this doesn't throw off a lot of waste heat like an internal combustion engine. So 30 to 40 percent more energy efficient. Oh, it even recaptures energy in braking, which saves on brakes. And so look at the numbers. And so we're, we don't need any government help on this. We're going to see a move just driven by capitalism, economics, to electrification in this same time frame. I didn't even make that part of the scenario, but you can see how it starts to fall out as we look at this. And that's the exercise you want to do with your team. 
you start to see the opportunities. Let me point out one. If I don't have to drive, I can do other things in the vehicle. I can be working, for example, which means I can live anywhere I want, which means it would take cost pressure out of the city as people start to move farther away from the office. Don't worry, we're going to talk about work from home more, but cost pressure comes out of the city. For people that do uh, construction, residential construction downtown, these things don't need to park, and so you don't need to make provisions for parking in your residential towers downtown. And so again, cost pressure comes out of residential housing in the cities. All sorts of good things. But I could also be having a glass of wine on the way home, but I don't want my favorite J. Lore Cabernet to be above or below desired temperature. So somebody better manufacture me an in-car wine cooler and have a system to get my wine into that car when I'm riding home. Or more practically, the car seat for the child that I'm traveling with. New opportunities for products and services. That's how this works. And then you can choose seeing those new opportunities or threats which to pursue. You may want to diversify out of auto body shops, out of gas stations, out of auto parts stores, out of the local oil change place. These are all places that might be affected if we have autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, fleet owners. So I'm going to suggest you do this exercise with your team after today. You pick a date, and again, January and July of next year might be interesting dates to vision. And then, with respect to brainstorming scenarios, pick the interesting ones and make your specific assumptions as detailed as you can, and then you start to talk about, okay, it's that date, this has happened, what are the implications? simple three-step process to help you build a more concrete vision, a more accurate vision of the future so you can make better business decisions. That's the process. Now, all sorts of other implications we didn't talk about here. So fewer deaths and injuries, for sure. Reduced worldwide medical costs and less lost productivity. Auto body shops, lower insurance rates. Fewer auto dealers, who wants to own a car? Uh, the auto dealers might be the last bastion of advertising support for uh, local newspapers and there go your little league sponsorships. What happens to AAA? We don't need it when we are not owning our vehicles. Uh, in our cities, a third of the road capacity in a typical city in this country is for parking. All that comes back into the system. Also, think about this in terms of roadway capacity. Humans need to be about, uh, what, two seconds apart? We learned that in driver's ed. With 3,600 seconds in an hour, divided by two seconds separation, a lane of traffic, city or highway, at best can handle 1,800 vehicles. Autonomous vehicles, hey, two-tenths of a second is infinity to a computer, 18,000 vehicles per hour. So you're gonna see the HOV lanes, those are gonna be non-human lanes pretty soon, and those Autonomous vehicles are going to slot in just like trains and move 10 times more vehicles, or at least we have that potential. So we have all the roadway capacity out there we probably need. <sighs> parking garages? I talked to somebody who builds parking garages. You know, they are now constructing two things different. Parking garages only with flat decks, not the old, you know, zigzag slope designs because you're gonna to have to repurpose this and they've spaced out the ceilings so they got more elevation because they know parking garages are going to be repurposed for things like residential and commercial property. Productivity while riding, my in-car wine cooler or baby seat or whatever, maybe I wanna exercise on the way to the office. Maybe I need to be in Los Angeles tomorrow and so I'm just going to get in a vehicle and sleep overnight from Colorado to LA, yeah competition with short haul air carriers. And that's just the vehicles that we ride in. How about these big rigs? Fewer accidents, lower transportation, shipping costs, fewer trucks on the road at any point in time because these things can move 24 by seven. You know, humans have this strange need to want to sleep for eight hours, not the computers, and so they can move all night long. But there go the truck stop stops, bye bye Flying J. And yeah, maybe you won't be able to do the arm pump anymore. Although these things have cameras. They program me that feature and we can still have the good old fashioned arm pump. That's the future we're heading into. And I think 2025 is a reasonable assumption. It's not so much about this scenario though. 
use that exercise with your team. Now, what we're talking about here in total is a world without work. This is a really interesting article that appeared in the Atlantic magazine. Technologists observe that the capabilities of machines, which are already formidable, continue to expand exponentially, while our own remain the same. And they wonder, is any job truly safe? In 2013, a few years ago, Oxford University researchers forecast that machines might be able to perform half of U.S. jobs in the next two decades. They're moving into the cognitive domain. What do we do when that happens? And while the projection was audacious, perhaps in a few cases, it didn't go far enough. And so there's an online calculator where you can look at the probability of a job being displaced through automation. And if you look at this list, let me zoom it a little bit for you so you can read it better. These are not just blue collar jobs. Data entry keyers, library technicians, new account, account clerks, tax preparers, insurance underwriters, right? These are white collar jobs too that are going to disappear because machines can do this faster, better, cheaper, more accurately than humans. And so we do have to have a conversation now in this country and globally what happens when the work that a human can do is just not as economically, keyword economically, not as economically valuable as what a cognitive machine can do? That is a real conversation that we need to have. But from business perspective, here's my thought. There are a couple different strategies in business and innovators often fail. If you're the first one ever to try something, hey, you're probably going to fail. That's not necessarily a bad idea. I think if you want to succeed more, you should fail more, learn fast, learn a lot from failure. But there's a different strategy, that of being a fast follower. Fast followers usually succeed. Let me cite for you Microsoft. We're all familiar with them. Microsoft is not an innovator. They generally don't invent things. They didn't invent spreadsheets. That credit goes to VisiCalc and Lotus123. But Microsoft sees when there are big innovations and then they copy, or less pejoratively, they're a fast follower. And so they make Excel, and they make a multi-decade commitment to continuous product improvement. Today, Excel is the most popular app, second most popular app in the world, following another copy, which Microsoft named Word. Uh, in case you're not hip to this one, there was a fundamental innovation in employee communication in 2013. It's called Slack. S-L-A-C-K, the searchable library of all communication and knowledge in your business. It's 100 times better than email. Microsoft studies it. They find all sorts of benefits. And so in 2016, they copied it with something called Microsoft Teams. So if you're looking for a replacement for email, it's already out there. The fact that Microsoft has entered the market to compete with Slack should tell you something important happened. So. Be a fast follower. It's made Microsoft, at least last time I looked, the second most valuable company in North America, fail less often. Fast followers usually succeed. So with respect to automation and these exponentials, be among the earliest companies to exploit the proven. So you watch for others in your industry or near your industry. Be curious, broadly watching what's going on in or near your industry. And when you see the proven benefits of a new technology, be a fast follower among the earliest companies to follow. Great strategy. To me, that's the takeaway. Now, I want to talk about the future of work and just come home and make this a very personal example. My son, Mike, is 29 years old. Since he graduated from college, as a college graduate, keep that in mind, he's been doing really one thing. He is a worldwide specialist in digital advertising, specifically Google and Facebook. That kind of stuff have, has not ex existed very long. And so as a 29 year old, you can be one of the most experienced people in the world. And now comes Google with their smart campaigns, artificial intelligence, the cognitive machines. Google introduces smart campaigns for small businesses. Uh, you might want to use this for your business, but that's not the point. This is a cautionary tale with respect to the future of work from a personal perspective. So now we have what we call AI or artificial intelligence or data-driven customer acquisition. Here's how Google smart campaigns work. 
Now recognize, this is also what Mike does. And so you want to advertise on Google. You have to specify a few things. Yeah, what's your budget? What is your target location geographically? By zip code, if you like, or MSA. Languages, goals. Uh, goals are things like, do you want web visitors? Do you want phone calls? Do you want people navigating to your location? Yeah, you got to tell Google what you're trying to achieve, what I call the conversions. But then their AI goes to work. Their artificial intelligence creates the ads for you. You didn't have to create that beautiful ad. And further, they test images. So they select different images that might be relevant to your ad, but they pay attention to things at a level of detail that Mike could never watch. Not only which image works best, but maybe which image works best on a Tuesday afternoon at 2.15. The level of detail that they can track goes way beyond what the human mind can possibly do. They make what we call the landing pages. That's where people arrive after clicking on your ad on Google. And then they optimize the pay-per-click bidding. So you're getting the best value for your dollar. And of course, they measure and refine and report. And now get this. This is their simple proposition to you as a potential Google advertiser. You like your guy Mike? Fine. Leave half your budget with Mike and give half to our artificial intelligence smart campaigns here and let's just see how it goes. Yeah, you know how that goes. And so here's the conversation I'm having with Mike and you might want to think about having with the people around you, your employees and your family members. We used to have a social contract in this country that you have a period of your life you go through, we call that the learning period. And once you're done and you graduate, whatever level of learning you're going to do, high school or college, whatever that is, then the rest of your life is doing. See, the thing is that doesn't work anymore in a world of exponential change. Our skills quickly become obsoleted. What we know, digital advertising gets obsoleted by the artificial intelligence. And so now we have to go back and learn and then do. And then learn, then do. So that's the new social contract. Learn, do, learn, do, learn, do. Continuous learning. That's what makes a valuable employee going forward. That's what makes a successful family member going forward. And yet, we've not had this conversation in this country. And so a lot of people are sitting there saying, hey, I fulfilled the social contract. I learned. What can I do? Well, I'm sorry, but the rules have changed. And so let's all recognize that and start talking about the reality of that. Learn, do, learn, do do. That's the world that we're in. Now I want to show you how amazing these machines are becoming. One thing they can do is recognize people better than people can recognize people. And so Apple on my Mac or iPhone makes a uh, memory periodically and uh, this one uh, June 9th 2005 was about my mom. Now look at this photograph I just paused on here. Google uses image recognition and it looks at my 30,000 photos in my photo roll and picks out all the ones with mom in them. Every other photo we just saw there had mom in it. And they included this one. Now this was not a digital photograph. This is an analog photograph taken in 1959 of my mom's graduating school class. It has no metadata with it. I simply scanned it in somewhere along the line and put it in Apple Photos. And yet Apple, through their consumer grade image recognition, chose to include this photo in the memory of mom for Dave because it sees mom in there. I don't know which one of these nearly 60 dozen identically dressed white female nurses is my mom. But Apple knows she's there. They know which one. That's how good this technology is getting. Now you think about all the implications of cameras. There's billions of cameras on the planet. I'm not just talking about the ones we carry. What about the ones you pass when you walk through the entrance to Target? What happens when computers can recognize us as we traverse? Privacy? <laughs> yeah, what's that? Welcome to the future. Now, let's talk about the future of marketing, trying to be practical about things that apply to your company. The future of marketing. Do you realize many of us sell to other businesses, what I refer to as B2B. 94% of B2B buyers now research online for their purchase decisions. 
the behavior has changed. 94% of B2B buyers research online for their purchase decisions. Now you're sitting there thinking, not me. Uh, I sell to some baby boomer white guy who's 60 years old. <laughs> yeah, that's me, but guess what? As a baby boomer 60 year old, I don't do the digital research myself. No, I task my team of millennials. They go out there and do it. And what are they doing? Here's what they're doing. They're mostly starting with Google. Do you realize 92% of people use a Google search? And then a further couple percent use YouTube, almost 3%. YouTube is the world's second largest search engine. If you're not doing video content, you're missing from the world's second largest search engine. Does not sound like a good idea. And then 84% of them go off to the resulting business websites. They didn't find you, guess what? It's now your competitors that are framing their thinking. And then they'll check out whatever third party stuff. That would be like press or awards or what have you, analysts. And then get this, 41% read user reviews. B2B, user reviews. Yeah, here's where that happens. Now everybody knows about Yelp for restaurants and uh, TripAdvisor for, for hotels. There is now essentially Yelp for B2B. It's called TrustRadius.com. B2B without the BS. Ooh, that's a little harsh. No buzzwords, no spin, just in-depth reviews from real users. Or here's another one, G2.com. G2 stands for or means it's sort of slang for intelligence like CIA. G2.com. Get the right software and services for your business. Over 1 million validated user reviews. B2B. Do you realize last month 3.2 million people showed up here? More than half of those arriving to this site via Google. They weren't even looking for the reviews, but Google directed them here. People are writing about you. What are they saying? Here's something I would recommend. Start paying attention to the, those reviews. And yes, some of them will be negative. Uh, try to have a little bit of a thick skin. Don't take it too personally. But aren't negative reviews really a gift? Thank you for telling me how I did not meet your expectations. Yeah, so three things when that negative review occurs. Number one, resolve the issue if possible. These critics often can become raving fans. Even if you have to go the extra mile and maybe the return on investment on that particular transaction is negative overall, maybe it's positive if you can turn that critic into a fan. Now you cannot resolve everybody's issue, but by doing so publicly, you're showing people that you own it. We all make mistakes. I'm gonna own it. I'm gonna be responsive. I'm gonna take responsibility. We wanna deal with people like that. And number three, you go back and run some kind of post-mortem or postpartum process inside your organization. What can we do to improve the underlying processes and products and services so this does not happen again next time? And so read your reviews, but here is another super practical idea for today. Read your competitors' reviews. They're probably gonna be negative. Number one, you're gonna feel a whole lot better seeing people complain about them. But here's the other thing to think about. Is it possible you're going to learn some things about your competition? Maybe their weaknesses, their gaps that you can exploit for better marketing messaging, better sales process, yeah. And so the idea of reviews is a gift on so many levels. The negative reviews allow us to get better and to compete better. So read your competitors, negative reviews. Okay, so we're talking about marketing and we all face this problem. This thousand X increase from today that our customers and our target audience is going to be dealing with. How do we break through that noise? Well, here is maybe the most important thing you're going to need to know today, at least with respect to customer acquisition. Every day, half of all the internet traffic starts with a search. Now, if you think about the other half where people navigated directly to a web address, a URL as we call them, you already won or lost, right? The battle's over. So the interesting part of the battle here is for the searchers. So half of all internet traffic starts with a search. There's two strategies, really, and only two strategies. Number one, you can create good quality organic content. Or number two, you can pay Google or the other services, Facebook, Amazon, etc., for your pay-per-click 
advertising. But did you ever think about what is the relative frequency of clicks on these various services? Yeah, now if you think about your own behavior, you probably got this. Do you mostly click on those ads you see at the top part of the Google page or have you learned either implicitly or explicitly to go below those because the ads are sort of corrupted by money anybody can pay to be there regardless of content value to you? Yeah, we go down and we click on the organic results mostly. And so on Google, fully 92%, 92% of all the clicks are on the organic content, the stuff that is free not necessarily free to make. It takes a strategy. It takes some insight into your target audience, but you don't have to pay Google. And so I've got nothing against the pay-per-click game. Hey, my son works on that. But to me, this 92% looks to be a lot more interesting. So let's talk about that game. And I cite here my various sources. I don't know if you can read that live. You can definitely download the slides and see it. Search engine land. Organic search clicks out number paid 12 to 1. So keep that in mind. Now, what to do as we look towards the future of marketing. This guy named Rand Fishkin did a very interesting experiment on Twitter a little while back. His tweet said this, hey, have 20 seconds, would love your help testing this. Approximately 500 people responded. Now, do not do what he did. This is not about doing this. It's about what we can learn from his experiment. So don't do this on your own website. Google may impose their death penalty, but look at what we can learn. And so here's the experiment that he ran on Google. Google does not tell us how they work. Uh, in fact, I don't think anyone at Google knows exactly how Google works anymore because there's so much artificial intelligence that's driving those algorithms. And the thing about AI is it can do amazing things, but it cannot tell you why it does those amazing things. And so I don't think even Google knows how Google works. But here's the most important thing you need to know as we look forward towards getting our fair share or more of the internet search traffic that starts every day at Google. What Rand suggested was go to Google and type best grilled steak. And you're going to get some search results. And here is the experiment that he ran. He said, you know what, the first result is probably going to be the Food Network with Bobby Flay. Click that result hit their website, but then bounce back to the search results page. So you're, you're not going to stay on that site. Okay, so just hit it and then bounce back. And then go down and find, probably at number four, Serious Eats, the food lab, and click that, but stay on that site. Now, you probably can guess what happened next. You might be amazed at how fast it happened. As these 500 people are going through this experiment with Rand, the search results change. Google learns that for whatever reason, when humans type these three words, best grilled steak, they prefer the content here to the content there. This happened in just over an hour, 70 minutes later, the results had changed. So what Google AI is doing is it's watching human interaction. Was it a short click? We didn't find what we want. We came back to look for the next thing. Or was it a long click? Our interaction with Google is a form of voting, which informs their AI. And so they are able to, for any word or phrase, and resulting search uh, results, discern good content, not as good content. So here's the takeaway for you for the future of marketing. It's not that Google has any kind of objective standard about what is good content and what is bad content. No, they are measuring your content value based on his interaction. There's your target audience. Did he find your content to be good or not so good? And so bottom line is this. Our job as marketers going forward in the future is to create content that is seen as valuable by our target audience. Our target audience, and sorry to be harsh, they don't care about us. They've got their own challenges, their own problems, their own pain. We're going to have to use our expertise to create content that plays to that pain, those problems, those objectives, educationally, typically. And I would suggest this. Keep in mind that all our brains are wired into the same exact radio station. It's called WIIFM, and that's an acronym. What's in it for me? 
That's what you're thinking right now as I'm talking. What's in it for me and my business? But as you're trying to reach your target audience, that's what their brain is saying. And so figure out what are they trying to get and how can you help them educationally or other content value strategy get there. So bottom line on marketing, future marketers, it's really just two things. Number one, you've got to provide value to your target audience. And number two, this is a highly analytical job. We're going to use data to drive and increasingly we're going to embrace automation. Now here's the sad thing for a lot of people that went into marketing. If you were a numbers person back in the day, there were many possible careers for you. I was a numbers person, I pick engineering. The STEM career, science, technology, engineering, math. Others num other numbers people went into finance or accounting. Lots of choices for the numbers people. And so who went into marketing? Some of the numbers refugees. They didn't exactly like the numbers, so they went to marketing where they didn't have to deal with so many numbers. Marketing is nothing but numbers today. This job has evolved. You better love numbers. You better think that uh, Google Analytics is awesome and Microsoft Excel is more entertaining than Netflix. Or you're not going to find the future marketing job to be particularly compelling. So jobs evolve away from people as well. Increasing automation. And so look for marketing automation and analytics in your marketing people. Okay, so I said this about business, right? The three imperatives, given that we've got a pandemic going on right here. Flawless social distancing, all uh, surface transition, transmission, we've got to pay attention to that. Maybe help account for the employees' kids for a while. And so let me give you my favorite inspirational example of what I call business process redesign. You're hopefully familiar with Costco. Great deals to be had here as long as you're willing to buy in bulk. March 26th of 2020. Costco is already starting to react to the pandemic. And so you can see that they're implementing the early forms of social distancing. You notice the uh, marks on the ground so us humans can space out what you might not notice, but I'll point out here. They've closed every other register. We'll talk a little bit about why, but this is all about starting to push people apart. Six feet is a valuable weapon when dealing with viruses. Now, they have closed all but one entrance and all but one exit. Why? Well, they don't want to overload the stores, and so they figured out some number, and they've got employees with clickers counting incoming customers and outgoing customers at those individual doors, comparing numbers to limit the in-store load. Give us humans every chance to be safe. Now, if they hit that number, they have a contingency plan, a socially distanced exterior queue. Here's what that looks like. Now, this is not going to be needed every single day, and it won't be needed long term. And so look at how they've done it. What do we have laying around here at Costco? Uh, well, a bunch of pallets, boss. Get them stacked up to separate the pedestrians from the traffic. Get across the street to Home Depot, buy a can of yellow spray paint, and mark out some you know, six-foot lines on the ground, and we're good to go. And so as we think about our business and how we evolve it, in the face of the pandemic, or for that matter, any of these other exponentials that are coming at us, your investments. Is it a temporary situation or a contingency like what we're seeing here? Do it on the cheap, right? Quick and dirty, brilliant. Or is it likely a permanent change? And I'll talk about some permanent changes coming at us. If it's a permanent change, I say, hey, implement as soon as possible, as soon as it's affordable. And so we want to do that simple test as we think about the changes coming down on our business. Temporary, on the cheap, permanent, as soon as possible. Now, notice across the street at Home Depot, same exact thing is going on. They figured out their in-store load is 300. They don't need as many shopping carts, but they also know on March 26th, that some of their customers are comfortable coming in the store and some are not. So over here, we've got parking for those that are comfortable coming in the store, come on in and buy. Over here, we've set up a curbside pickup corral for those that are not comfortable. We've got to deal with both populations if we want to be successful. Now, how do we create the partition between these populations? Well, Quick and dirty. We got tons of shopping carts. Stack them up. So to me, those are inspirational examples of what are short-term kind of contingency reactions. Keep that in mind. 
Now back across the street at Costco, new surface management procedures. This is my Costco card. This is plastic. The New England Journal of Medicine tells us that SARS-CoV-2 is viable for 72 hours on plastic. Now you might remember before mid-March, if you're a Costco member, you would always hand your card to your Costco checkout clerk. He or she would keep possession of it until the transaction is done, and then you get it back. Yeah, propagation, to say nothing of breaking a six-foot distance between us. And so, new processes. You don't hand off the card anymore. Instead, you stand with arm outstretched. They scan the code. The scan gun does not need to be within two feet. We can achieve an easy six feet here, and I maintain possession of the card. No virus transmission. If that card didn't have that code on it, hey, print something on a sticker and stick it on people's cards. There's always ways to adapt. And so no handoff of membership cards. Surface, surface management, one more thing we've got to consider. And then socially distanced checkout. Look at this. You can see the yellow lines here separating us by six feet. But what you might not think about is how do you handle the situation as people start to approach the checkout clerks? You cannot maintain a six foot boundary. They're not physically, but virtually with plexiglass. I'll highlight where that plexiglass is because it's hard to see in the photograph. Genius. And so the plexiglass barrier creates that distance. Now, two weeks later, by then we understood that masks were important. And so now everybody's got masks. And I want to point out, in your business, you have two challenges. You have number one, the reality of safety for your employees and for your customers, your suppliers, your partners. But number two, don't we also all have the challenge of the perception of safety? And so we're fighting both of those battles. You want to win both the reality of safety and the perception of safety. And I cannot see anybody who's doing this better, faster, more aggressively on more fronts than Costco. Now, notice right behind her, there is the next register. It was a symmetrical design initially. Nobody thought about social distance when laying out the stores. That wasn't our old design paradigm. And so a customer that would be checking out at that register would break the barrier of six feet behind her. That's why alternate registers are closed. Now, two weeks later, I come back to Costco. And as far as I can tell, they spent no extra money, no equipment. I don't know exactly how they did this flip, but they flipped alternating registers. So now they can put two checkers back to back with each other, separated by plexiglass from the public. You know, I don't think there could probably be a harder business to redesign than something like Costco retail operation when you're dealing with the public en masse, and yet they have done a great job. Not only do I think they're doing a good job from a reality perspective, but I feel safe. Sorry, dropped my remote control. I feel safe when I am in Costco. They are winning this battle on both fronts. As you start to think about redesigning your business processes, fight both battles. They are a great example for the rest of us. Got Siri on here. Now, with respect to other permanent changes, here's another thought for you. If you were selling 100% in person in the past and 0% in person now, and I'm especially thinking those of us that sell B2B and have a direct sales force, but I guess this could apply even for retail operations. There is a spectrum there. And uh, we're gonna come back from the zero side of that spectrum back towards 100, right? But are we gonna come all the way back? Where is the optimal point? My guess is it's not at either end. And yes, it may be most of the way back, but what if it's not all of the way back? What if some of our sales continues to be done digitally, remote, virtually, Zoom? You know what that is? What that part of that spectrum recovered is? That's more productivity. That's cost savings. When salespeople don't have to travel to customer site, for example, they can make more sales calls in a day. They can save a lot on travel costs. And so I'm not saying that most of our sales doesn't return to the old process, but all of it, maybe not. Maybe there is a better way. And I'm gonna suggest that that better way may even bring more effectiveness. So here's what I mean by that as you start to think about changing your processes. Let's say sales used to be direct. Your salesperson face-to-face -face with your prospect. 
one or two sales calls a day. Maybe one if they had to jump on an airplane. Maybe two if they had a couple hour drive time to wherever that uh, prospect was located. And now we have something like Zoom. And so now we've got Zoom in between us. I gotta say one big thing happening with this pandemic that's a really good thing for business, gonna help us on the other side. All of us humans have moved faster along a technology adoption curve than we were ever gonna do before. Who would have been thinking we'd be doing this forum using Zoom? And I'm in Pittsburgh and you're in Colorado Springs or wherever you're sitting right now. Or you're watching a recording of this after the fact or re-watching a recording to get more value the second time through. Technology. We've gone farther down that adoption curve than we otherwise would have. Now, back to sales. We've got our salesperson and our prospect, but we're on Zoom, so we didn't have to incur the travel time or cost. So maybe we're also gonna bring along our product specialist to this meeting. And maybe, so they can run the numbers, they're gonna bring along their CFO. So maybe we're gonna bring along our CFO and we're gonna geek out on the numbers and make sure this whole business case proves in. And maybe, you know, there's always gatekeepers. In my world, it's the IT people. The IT people don't say yes, but they sure can say no. And so I'm gonna bring the gatekeepers right into this meeting, get them on board and get them to be champions too. That is a better sales call than the way we did it before. And it's possible because we don't have the travel time and costs, and so we can bring more people on both sides. This is the kind of new thinking we should be bringing to the world of the 2020s and embracing technology. Now let's go a little further. And I got this idea not from myself, but from a CEO I talked to one day. He said this, we're using DoorDash, and what we do is we deliver food to all of their people and all of our people. And I really remember exactly the word he used next. So after we do the sales call, we're having lunch and just talking. We are now having, with our customers and prospects, the most intimate, that was the word, the most intimate conversations we have ever had with more people on our side, more people on their side. Talk about relationship building. And so I think there's an opportunity on the other side of this to do some things better, cheaper. That's the kind of thinking you should bring to your business. Now, while we're at it, I wanna talk a little bit about the technology I'm using here today to do this, it's totally free. You probably haven't seen very many speakers on Zoom do a fully integrated studio, and yet it costs me nothing, no special equipment here. Here's how I'm doing it. And again, the typical way that a speaker appears on Zoom is there's a little talking head in one window and slides on another window and there's no interaction. You know, I'm here TV weather person style. I can interact with my slides and point to things and it's a different kind of experience. And I'm thinking especially, better sales calls. I'm talking uh, customer testimonial video perhaps, or a plant tour, a product demo via video, better slides. Uh, key principle, show, don't tell. Show, don't tell, right? That's a better way to do it. And so you wanna make your presentations really visual. And if you like this technology, it's called the Open Broadcast Studio Software, OBS Studio for short. And it's free, and it runs on PCs and Macs. And so let me show you just briefly how this works. And so here, I have my video sources. This is the user interface for OBS. I'll blow this up a little bit. And you can see there's some video sources here that are being put into one stream. And so the first one is the video capture coming from the webcam right here on my Mac. And so that's what my Mac looks like. There's a webcam right in the middle. That's the video stream of me. Now, OBS can remove the background. As long as it's a solid color, not matching your skin color or what you're wearing, the background's gone and you're still here. My background happens to be green. It doesn't matter what the background color is. As long as it's different from you, it's gone. So there is Dave layer one. In addition, we've got my virtual environment. So the conference room that you're seeing over here, that's a completely static image. That is coming from the, uh, from the, uh, background of OBS and then of course there is the PowerPoint presentation and so you see that coming right from my Mac and so there's PowerPoint or Keynote and these are the three layers put together dynamically now I'm going to show you live exactly how this works 
you want to see the very background layer without Dave? There's the full virtual studio. You want to add in Dave? Here's Dave, layer two. You want to add in the PowerPoint presentation from the Mac screen? Here's that, layer three. Completely on the fly, you can do better sales presentations with your audience. OBS Studio. Now, one more book. And by the way, I have no particular uh, relationship with Peter Diamandis. I just love his thinking. He wrote another book after Abundance. And remember the podcast I referenced? You can get 100 great episodes. Really future-focused person. I got a lot of other people I follow as well, but just to focus on one. Peter Diamandis next wrote a book called Bold. And I would suggest read chapters 1 through 3 on this one. Or better yet, get audible.com and listen to them. I listen to hundreds of audiobooks that I don't have time to read. It's all about the accelerations that are impacting our world. How to go big, create wealth, and impact the world. That is where you'll learn about this 1000x kind of deal we're having to contend with. Too much information and breakthrough. Now let's talk a little bit about long-term impacts of COVID. And I want to talk a little bit about commercial real estate. <laughs> Again, there are so many topics. I could talk on this all day long, so you'll definitely want to check out the recording, which has, again, the more detail that I've pointed out. Long-term impacts of COVID. Accelerated technology adoption. On the other side of, us, of this, we should be making use of the fact that humans have moved faster along this path. And so we're using Zoom for things like sales calls. Uh, we're using it for team meetings. We're using new technologies like Slack, which granted was invented in 2013, and Microsoft's Teams, which was a good copy, came along in 2016. And for many of us, every time we boot up Windows, that stupid team thing, Teams thing is coming up, we gotta kill it. We weren't paying attention to what it was, but now we are. It's 100 times better than email for capturing employee communication documents, it's all searchable. Again, I could talk on that one for three hours alone. And so let's make use of those for better productivity, lower cost on the other side of this. Recognize that we have been willing to move faster because of the overall change we've had to deal with. Number two, there are winners and losers. You know who I think the winners are in this? North America, US, Mexico, Canada, loser, China. And here's why. We businesses collectively recognize that it's a really bad idea to concentrate our supply chains into one place that's really far away. So we're going to decide, we're going to bring back some of that manufacturing. We need to diversify. We have to have some closer to home so we can be more responsive to changes more quickly. Yeah, that's interesting. But as we start to reshore some of that manufacturing from China to North America, we don't want to pay higher costs, so guess what? We're going to embrace automation. And so bringing manufacturing back to this country is going to drive automation faster than would have been. And so the winners out of this are us, Mexico and Canada, in that order, loser China. Wasn't a good idea to manufacture all our PPE, all our N95 masks over there in China, was it? And so let's think about that in each of our businesses. What can we do to diversify and create a little bit more safety? Maybe even if the cost is higher, but can we do it through automation at the same cost? Maybe the answer is yes. Reduced office centricity. Wow, we just realized this work from home thing isn't as bad as we all thought. And so we see articles like this, Forbes. After announcing Twitter's permanent remote work policy, Jack Dorsey extends the same courtesy to Square employees. Permanent remote work, work from home, WFH. Shopify permanently moves to work from home model. NPR, get a comfortable chair, permanent work from home is coming. Why? Well, here's one of the foremost researchers on work from home. His name is Dr. Nicholas Bloom there at Stanford, my alma mater. He says this, maybe a year from now, by the way, think about it, maybe it is a year from now we're still dealing with this. I can't say exactly because any day a magic bullet could come along like that vaccine or a really good antiviral therapeutic. But if I were you in my business, I'd be thinking, maybe a year from now, at least run the contingencies, right? The scenarios, the implications, the opportunities. Maybe a year from now, 
firms will say you can come back into the office two or three days a week and spend the other couple of days working at home. Why? Well, before COVID, their studies found, amazingly, that work from home employees were 13% more productive, which is huge. That's almost a day extra per week. Employees commute less and work more. Employees are happier. Quit rates dropped by 50%. This is what their studies found. Companies save money, like lower real estate costs. Employees save money, like commuting. Now think about this. If you have a big conference room for that weekly team meeting, is it possible in the future, even when we can all come back together at the same densities as before, that, you know, this Zoom thing works pretty well most of the time. We're gonna do three out of our four meetings via Zoom, and then the one meeting a month that we do when we're physically together, why pay for a conference room for the whole month for one meeting for a couple hours? Let's go to the local co-working space. Where's the WeWork office? We'll rent that for two hours and save all that square footage. And so we are very likely to need less square footage in the future as we start to rethink office centricity. Now, that brings up an interesting question which is worth thinking about. WFH, WTL? Hey, if I work from home, where to live? I can live anywhere. <laughs> By the way, my son, the younger one, 26, James, he works as an investment banker downtown San Francisco, in fact, right next to the Twitter headquarters. Yeah, he's not there. He can work anywhere, and his company isn't coming physically back together for at least a year, right? Investment bankers can work anywhere, so he's here in Pittsburgh, has his own bedroom, his own floor of the house, three or four acres, a nice wooded property, instead of a two-bedroom apartment on the 31st floor of a high-rise where you got to get in this steel box called an elevator, you can live anywhere when you're working from home. And so, why not Colorado Springs, right? Inexpensive, nice quality of life. I'm going to challenge you to think about how do you as a community start to reach the people who are maybe living in super expensive San Francisco but can now work and live anywhere? Interesting question for us to think about. How do we break through? My top strategy would be this. Who in our area, it's all about you know person-to-person -person communication, social networks, who in our area is already a work from home person that might have been there before. Can we leverage these people? Can we reach them and get this to spread virally, word of mouth? I mean, these are just the questions we start to think about because frankly, Colorado Springs would be a nice place to live, a lot less expensive, even if I work in downtown San Francisco, in downtown San Francisco. Those are the new questions. So back to commercial real estate, CRE. Here's my thoughts about impact on this. Near term, Maybe we need more space, right? We gotta achieve this virtually flawless social distancing. Maybe we gotta spread out a bit, you know, good ventilation, maybe more walls. And so near term, the next one to two years, maybe more space. But when we get to the other side of this pandemic, long term, probably less space because work from home will be a thing. I observe that 60% of US employees cannot work from home. They're the in-person, the essential workers, so I'm not talking about that part of the population, but for the 40 that can theoretically work anywhere, yeah, where are we gonna have them work? How are we gonna structure our business for those people? Where are those people going to choose to live geographically? Interesting question. Now, I also think there'll be some other permanent impacts. Leisure travel is way down, but when we feel safe, I think it goes back to where it was and grows from there because humans, we have a wanderlust, we want to explore, we want to adventure. So leisure travel will return to normal. But business travel, mm, I don't see it. I don't think it's returning to previous levels because what we have realized is there is huge productivity. Say nothing of the cost savings, just huge productivity in being remote some of the time. And so in the past, if I would have gone to four conferences around the country, maybe I'd go to three physically, but one remotely. Big productivity gain, cost savings. The problem for the airlines is the business travelers were the most profitable part of their segment, right? Not the leisure travelers. And that's not coming all the way back because there's benefits for us business people not to go all the way back. And so I see permanent impacts on airlines and everything that trickles down from there. 
If this is your world, maybe you want to do the what-if scenarios and talk about the implications. Not the same hotel occupancy, lower rental car utilization. By the way, rental cars, whole other problem with these fleets of autonomous vehicles. And so business travel, probably not returning to previous levels. Now, I've got two quick topics for you in closing. The future of, I don't know, dot, 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 the future. We have great technology now, which is called virtual reality and augmented reality. Now I have here a cheap little $4 headset that uh, Google put out the standard, it's called Cardboard. And this has you know, a couple lenses that gives me split screen vision. And I can open up this thing and pop in the uh, supercomputer that's already in my pocket in a split screen mode right here. And this thing makes a, uh, a stereo kind of uh, vision like the old Viewmasters. But because the phone has accelerometers and stuff, I don't have to read the news or even watch somebody else's video recording the news. No, I can now be inside the news. And so as I turn left and right and I look up and down, I'm literally inside this world. And while I'm showing it to you as a 2D, I see it with my headset 3D. Now you think about it, meetings. What if we could do this for meetings, except I look sort of stupid if I got this thing on and you got that thing on and we're all wearing these stupid looking headsets. Uh, also notice here, I can be inside people's houses. We got augmented reality, so there's names. The power just came back on in Puerto Rico, by the way, in this particular news story. But what if, and this is real, this is where this is going, just to show you a picture of the future. One of my former uh, co-workers, a guy named Drew Perkins, is running this company called Mojo Vision, introducing the world's only contact lens that elevates your vision. So what they're doing, and again, you might not even think this is possible had you not seen the example of the Cray Model 2 to an Apple Watch in 30 years. We're now gonna take this, and we're gonna take this, and we're gonna cram it all into that little contact lens. So there will be screens, processors, batteries, that we can literally place on both eyes. And then as we engage in the real world, let's say I'm on a bike and I'm climbing to a summit there in uh, Colorado Springs, a lot of great uh, fun mountain biking in your area. I've got this augmented reality view of the world. Yeah, that's where we're going. Amazing technology. Now, I wanna share with you one last thought from Elon Musk. He's working on the idea of starting to combine microprocessors with the human brain. And frankly, this is already happening. My niece, Ashley, last year had a microprocessor connected to her brain, directly to some neurons. Now, the purpose in that case was to restore her hearing in her left ear, a cochlear implant. But where could you go with that? Check this out. You're a neuroscience company, and you're working to build basically an interface to the brain. Yeah. Electrode to neuron interface at a mic micro level. OK, what is that? Like, I'm going to have like, a plug in my head that's going to fit into mm -hmm. a hard drive? Like, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah. Ch a chip and a bunch of tiny wires. This, this would be implanted surgically. And it would do what? Could you input? Could you download Jim? Mm-hmm. Yes. What, what, what <laughs> the long-term aspiration for Neuralink was, would be tr to achieve a symbiosis with uh, artificial intelligence um, and to achieve a sort of democratization of, of intelligence uh, such that it is not monopolistically held in a purely digital form by governments and, and large corporations. Basically, an effort for man to merge with machine in yes. a healthy way. Yes. To beat machines, you basically have to merge with machines. Most likely, yes. Essentially, how do we ensure that the future constitutes the, the sum of the will of humanity? Um, and so if we have billions of people with a high bandwidth link to the AI extension of themselves, it would actually make everyone hyper smart. Yeah, so maybe that's where we're going. Ultimately, a merger of machines and man. I leave you with this thought. Peter Senge, The Fifth Discipline, old book. There is but one sustainable competitive advantage in business. Yeah, if you think about it, all products and services commoditized with age. Marketing messages get copied and surpassed. USPs, unique selling propositions, lose the you, the uniqueness. Patents expire. You have one advantage. That is the ability to learn faster than the competition. That's why you want to embrace technology. 
Hey, thanks for joining me for the future and how to prosper in it. Looks like we've got a little bit of time for some Q&A, so let's go.